Hello, hello, and welcome to this Blueprint Med School Tutors webinar. Tonight, we're putting on our fancy hats and jackets, and we're sitting around the fire. And we're going to talk about a time honored tradition, the pathophysiology of heart failure. Uh, and if that doesn't get your Jimmy's rustled, I don't know what will. Camden, introduce yourself, my friend. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm looking forward to our fireside chat tonight. Um, I'm Camden McDowell. Uh, I'm a medical uh, student uh, year three at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. I'm also a, a USMLE tutor here um, with Med School Tutors and Blueprint. Um, and I really, you know, I love studying step one. I love helping students work on step one. And so today we're going to talk about a subject that is uh, the bane of many, <laughs> many people's step one and step two. And so this should be a, hopefully a productive uh, you know, conversation. Oh, this is going to be a lot of fun. My name is uh, Dave Delmegro. I am a senior resident in 62 days and attending um, in emergency medicine, hanging out in rural Pennsylvania. Um, and this is going to be a lot of fun. So a little bit about who we are, uh, Blueprint um, Med School Tutors. We've been doing this for a long time from the pre-med through the med through residency all the way up uh if it exists as in medicine we probably can do it so that's that's just our little mention um and you know this is a this is a combination med school tutors webinar we tutor people camden and i do so like you can work with someone like us uh, so it's a reminder that we're not just show ponies we're also workhorses too. Speaking of workhorse, oh my God, I should have gave more, more warning until we got into this one. Look at this. There's a lot of pictures tonight. What's that at the bottom right? Is that Cal 3? No, we're not going to do a lot of calculus tonight. Um, but heart failure. In order to understand heart failure, we're going to have to talk a little bit about cardiac output. So Cardiac output is the heart rate times the stroke volume itself. So the amount of blood that gets into the left ventricle with every beat and then how many beats are per minute. And then you can break this up, the, uh, the size of the, the stroke into your end diastolic volume, your end systolic volume. And then you think of it as preload, afterload, and contractility. So if you've never seen this chart, and again, if you guys have questions at any time, um, by all means, if we're going too fast, um, what's it called? Um, if you had, need something clarified, by all means, toss it in there. So just, we're talking about basic heart physiology. The amount of blood that goes out is a function of the amount of blood in it times how many times it does this. And how many times it does this, the stroke volume is a function of preload, is a function of afterload, and is a function of contractility. Preload is the amount of blood that goes into the heart. In our next slide, Camden will talk about how, you know, stretch and Frank Starling's law of the heart and all that good stuff. So I won't belabor that too much. Afterload is kind of like the pressure opposing blood leaving the heart. The way it was once described to me is that pretend you're at a restaurant and there's a door, you know those little floppy doors that open both ways? So, and if there's not a lot of pressure on that big floppy door, then it's easy to open. There's a little afterload. But if you put a bunch of boxes on the front of that door, that, that's representative of an increased afterload. So the pressure pushing back at you is your afterload. And then your contractility is everything else. So to keep it fairly simple, how hard is it squeezing? So independent of the amount of blood in there and independent of the back pressure from the vasculature. So it is the change in pressure for a given amount of volume in this case. So, and again, we're gonna try and make this and come back to this again and again, because I want all this to build on it so that you guys can understand. And we have some practice questions at the end. So we'll try and build on this. Again, some basic cards review. Camden, this looks like the, the, the base God first aid. 
<laughs> it is. It may have uh, it may have been taken right out of first aid. <laughs> no, exactly. So as David was mentioning, in order to understand, you know, heart failure, we have to figure out what is going on at, at baseline. What is the you know, fundamental physiology of the heart? And I see we just had a bunch of people uh, start to join. Feel free to post in the chat as we go through this, as David was saying, with any questions you might have. Mm -hmm. And also, we like this to be kind of communicative. Uh, I'm going to ask you some questions as well so that we can work through some of this physiology. So all I wanted to show on this slide was to get us acquainted, you know, not just with the terms that David just talked about, but now let's put them a little bit into action. So this is our cardiac cycle. You probably have seen something like this before. And if you have first aid, you've definitely seen this. I always like to start off and think, you know, where am I respective to the lub and the dub of the heart? You know, the systole and the diastole, the valves closing. And at the very start of this, I like to think of kind of the, the start of the cardiac cycle in my mind is that start of systole. This is when that mitral valve closes, our lub. And then the next thing, you know, that we think that the heart does as it, um, you know, builds up the pressure in order to, uh, uh, um, cause uh, the cardiac output, cause the you know, blood to shoot out of the heart, is it builds up the isovolumetric contraction. Isovolumetric contraction. This means it's not changing volume. It's just building up pressure. And then, boom, our aortic valve opens and poof, we shoot out our blood. We get a kind of a rise uh, in left um, uh, ventricular uh, pressure for a moment as we squeeze out all that blood. We finish systole. We get our dub in our heart sound. So we've had our lub and our dub. And now we decrease our left ventricular pressure uh, as we go through our isovolume, uh, um, uh, the opposite of our isovolumetric contraction. And then we have our mitral valve opening. Remember, that's going to kind of gate the flow of blood from our left atrium to our left ventricle. That's going to bring it back here. That's going to give that preload back and allow it to go into our left ventricle. The skin's going to build up our pressure and then squeeze, give our cardiac output, just like, just like David was saying, cardiac output um, is going to be foundational to our understanding of what happens when the heart goes wrong or when something goes wrong with the heart. Awesome. Beautiful. So that yeah. kind of gets us, um, Ed, David, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I, you know, it's again, it's just, we're, we're, we're I'd really like that. It's just beating the basics, understanding heart failure, which is one of the hardest ones on step one and step two, goes so much down to you understand what it's supposed to be doing. Because once you understand that, understand that, understanding what it's not doing is so straightforward at that point. Exactly. Let's go to the next slide. So this kind of gets, uh, this is one of our, our last slides about the basic kind of grounding physiology. But this is something called a you know, Frank Starling curve. I don't know if that rings any bells. It may, may or may not. But the whole idea is that you know, the amount of blood you know, that we get out of our heart is a consequence of the stretch of that left ventricle. And so you know, always start off with thinking about a healthy person. So a healthy person, we have a certain amount of end diastolic volume. That's what we have here on our X axis. So this is our left ventricular end diastolic volume. This is the amount of blood at the end of the diastole, right? You know, when the mitral valve closes, that's in our left ventricle. Remember, just like we saw in the last chart, this is the volume that the left ventricle is going to compress, 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 and shoot out to help generate our cardiac output. There's a really cool thing about the heart, though, and that's that as we increase, so we move this direction along this axis, as we increase our left end this, this diastolic volume, we stretch our heart and our heart has this great kind of elastic property to it, which is a uh, you know a function of actually um, our uh, sarcomeres that allows the myocardium to increase the force with which it can uh, uh, um, uh, uh, contract and uh, increase the volume that we're able to get out with every uh, heartbeat as we increase the stretch. So we increase our pre-stretch. It's almost like we're a rubber band way out here. Then boom, we snap back together and we're able to get way more volume out. This is a nice homeostatic mechanism that allows us to compensate for when we have additional preload come back to the heart, when we have additional venous return coming back to our left, to our right ventricle, or left, right atrium that works its way over to our right uh, left ventricle. As that preload increases and our left ventricle stretches, we're able to get more out. 
Now, the key thing here that we're going to return to a little bit later is, uh-oh, what happens when this goes too far? And that is a foundation of what's happening when we start having heart failure, is we lose some of this kind of stretch to contractility relationship. Exactly. So, again, again, just such, so important to understand this, because when we talk about the path of fizz, it's going to come right from here. And I know a lot of you have seen this picture too. Camden, tell us a little bit about, because this is littered all over step one. Yeah, this is littered all over step one. And uh, for those of you out in the audience, I want some feedback. Don't make me do this alone. Let's do this together. Uh, which is, you're going to see the same picture. Uh, the picture. On, let's start with the picture on the left. You're going to see this picture on step one. It's going to be there. You're probably going to see it on step two. But the very important part of this is we just talked about the cardiac cycle. This is showing us the cardiac cycle just in a different way. And so I guess what I want to have us do is tell me, tell me where we are when we start our contractions. Mm. That's a good question. Hmm? So like, where, where do you start on this chart? And I'm just going to let it sit here in the, the chat for a second to see if anyone wants to chime in. But and let me be more specific. Where does the mitral valve close? That's what I mean. Awesome. Uh, oh, looks yeah. like we got an answer right away. A Exactly. That's where we're starting. We're starting right here. This is our mitral valve closing. And the key thing to hear is to think about our volume and our pressure. Remember on that last chart that we saw, the very first thing that happens of systole is we have our isovolumetric contraction. Look at this. It's a vertical line. Nothing about our volume is changing. And then what happens at B? Any ideas? I'll give it a second for folks to type it out. Yeah, exactly. You're on fire. Uh, mm -hmm. Our audience is on fire. Yeah, so exactly. The aortic valve opens. So we have our opening of our aortic valve at B. And then just like I said in the last, um, I like to add sound effects. So I think of this kind of like whoosh of our blood coming out. Uh, you know, into our aorta. That's nice when you start thinking about murmurs, but that's for another conversation. Uh, and then you go to C, what's happening at C. That's our closing of the aortic valve. And then just like we saw last time, look, there is no change in our uh, volume as we work our way down and uh, uh, decrease our pressure. And then we get to D, which is going to be the start of our diastole with that mitral valve opening. And we have a refilling. Notice how we're traveling left to right on our volume. We have a refilling of our um, left ventricular volume. Awesome. I love this chart. You should get comfortable with this chart. It's going to be on step one. Now, let's make it a quiz time. Here, I'll even write, write it for us. Quiz. Exactly. Um, I want us to do each one of these and try to figure out what is going wrong with the heart or what is going, you know, has changed about our heart that leads to each one of these charts. So let's talk through it first. Let's talk through what I'm going to call panel A over here. You know, what do we notice difference about this? Um, I guess, you know, one thing that we notice right away is our maximum volume is decreased. Interesting. Our maximum volume is decreased. Our minimum volume is unchanged, so it's equal. You know, some pressure change up here has changed. Okay. What do we think about when we think about it? This one. And actually, my apologies, I drew this the wrong direction. This is the direction we're going. Even after uh, thinking about these slides uh, so often, sometimes you get it mixed up. We're increasing our volume and we're increasing um, some of that pressure. Exactly. Right there, increased preload. Increased preload. This is that Frank Starley mechanism that we talked about. Increase that um, preload coming back we're able to eject it all back out and get back down to the same volume. Great. That can be homeostatic. There needs to be nothing wrong with our patient for that to happen. But let's talk about what happens on this one. What do we think is going on here? So again, in the solid line, this is our normal cycle. Here, we're increasing the pressure. Here, we're increasing that volume that we have at the end of systole, our end systolic volume in our left ventricle. And 
I see some ideas coming through here. Yep, we have end systolic volume. Awesome. Yes. The pathology, exactly. We're thinking in one, one general thing that's going on here is what would cause us to have too much left pretty much afterwards, too much end systolic volume, and see how high we're having to kick our pressure in order to get blood out. This is pathognomonic with increased afterload. We have something, be it aortic stenosis or, or some other pathology that is increasing the afterload that our heart has to work against. Basically, our heart is having to work against a higher pressure. And in order to get that blood out, it has to increase its pressure higher to get it passed into the aorta. But then the problem is because that pressure uh, externally is so high, we have to kind of almost shut our, um, you know, uh, uh, amount of fluid that we're able to get out at a prematurely. And so we're left with this higher end systolic volume. A great cause of this typically for step one to think about is aortic stenosis. Okay, let's finish it up with this guy right down here. So let's see here. We've got, again, normals in black, uh, uh, solid line, and we're having a shift where our volume is less, our end systolic volume, sorry. We have some increase in our pressure here, no change in our end diastolic volume. What comes to mind when we're thinking about this? Yeah, great. We've got a good audience tonight that are on fire. You guys are experts. Um, exactly. This is going to be increased contractility. And so think about that. Let's just think about the you know, basic uh, physiology here, which is we have the same volume, but our heart is better at contracting. Something is allowing us to have increased contractility, whether or not that's something that we did for free intervention or some homeostatic mechanism. And that's allowing us to get more blood out. And so we're going to have this um, uh, lower end systolic vo volume, even though that we start off with the same diastolic volume. So what does that mean about our stroke volume? Is it going to be increased or decreased in this final case? <laughs> exactly. It's going to be increased. So we're going to have a lot of blood and it's uh, uh, that we're going to be kicking out of the heart. That was rapid review, but hopefully that gets everyone on the same page when we start really thinking about the path of, sorry, the physiology of how the heart works. Beautiful. And with all that physiology, we can start to turn towards some of the pathophysiology now. Now this slide, we're gonna spend a lot of time here. So we're gonna get comfy on this one. What is the most common condition that causes acute heart failure and chronic heart failure? Give, we'll give everyone a couple seconds. So the most common condition that predisposes to acute heart failure and predisposes to chronic heart failure. Does anyone have any ideas? And again, common things are common. So we got, we got one there, acute MI. The most common way to lose half your heart function is to infarct half of your left ventricle. <laughs> so in a matter of hours, your EF goes from 65 to 35, bad. And on the flip side, what is the most common cause of chronic heart failure? Which is largely the one that you'll be asked to understand and manage on step one and step two. Excellent, it is indeed hypertension. Hypertension is often called the silent killer because it takes a long time for this to happen. And why I'm leaving this slide up for the next five or so minutes is because it is so important to think about the pathophysiology of heart failure. And I will relate it to something that's a little more you know, well understood. So um, beach season's coming, right? Isn't Camden? I believe so, or I hope so. so. <laughs> I, I, me too. So I'm going to Atlantic City this weekend. Uh, so it's time to hit the gym, I'd say. So um, what's it called? Sun's out, guns out. Exactly. 
Um, so what, what am I going to do? I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to lift things. And my muscles are going to be kind of unhappy with that. So, because there's going to be little micro tears and damage and inflammation, and they're going to react to their environment by increasing the amount of musculature um, that are in whatever particular muscle that I happen to be working out. It's leg day. So, the heart is no different. If you have hypertension, that is like the heart getting an increase in the amount of strength it needs. Now consider if we didn't change anything. Let's say we have a 30 year old with an ejection fraction of 65%, a stroke volume of about 100 cc's and a blood pressure of 120 over 70. Boring, boring, boring. And all, and all that they put out 100 cc's. That's their stroke volume, a heart rate of 60. Now, if, if let's say that, that, um, that blood pressure goes from 140 to one, excuse me, 120 to 140, what do you think is going to happen to your stroke volume if nothing else changes? Is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? Or is it going to stay the same? What do you guys think? going to go down. If you've changed nothing but added afterload, your stroke volume is going to decrease. Your body is going to notice that. The RAS system here, its job is to measure how much perfusion the organs are getting by using how much perfusion the kidney is getting as a surrogate. Remember the macula densa cells and the juxtamulite glomerular apparatus and all that stuff? The amount of sodium chloride going, going through tells you how much adenosine is released that inhibits renin. Oh boy, we're digging deep. Let's come on back. It's going to be um, a word salad. <laughs> so the whole point being that your kidney is going to notice that an increase in afterload means there's less fluid coming to the kidney. It senses danger and decreased amount of, of perfusion. Now, your kidney is not evolutionarily designed to live to 60, 70, 80, 90. You know what it's designed to do? Run from that bear that's in front of you. Our forefathers and, you know, and our foremothers, they had to run. Their lifespan was 30. Heart failure. Heart failure is when the bear claw got you. So that was it. So we're not really well designed to handle these small changes over a large amount of time. So what our heart does is it goes to the gym. The renin angiotensin system causes cardiac remodeling, which then causes the heart to go to the gym and increase by adding the sarcomeres along the myocardium, which is all fine and good. And that's, that could be normal, Kim. And I, I noticed you mentioned this in the previous slide. It was well done. Some of these changes doesn't need to be pathologic. So marathon runners, who I think are pathologic by nature, I can't <laughs> um, have very strong hearts to the point where they're hanging in the 40s or 50s when they're chilling. Very strong hearts. That's physiologic response. And a little bit of a pathologic response isn't going to kill you either. But the problem and why heart failure is such the chronic silent killer is because this takes 10, 15, 20, 25 years. So if you're a 25 or 30 and your heart, your blood pressure is 140, your heart's gonna go for the gym for a couple of years. And then the RAS system is gonna remodel it so that it gets to that level where it's able to compensate for that increased afterload. But that RAS system also causes vasoconstriction. Can we see where we're going to go poorly here? It's a long-term positive feedback loop. The same RAS that saves hurt in the end. So you end up with this cycle. If it's 140 and your heart is compensated for it now, it's going to go to 150 because of the vasoconstriction. 
And you're going to end up in this cycle of cardiac remodeling and vasoconstriction. So until you hit a critical point where you're either are unable to perfuse all this big myocardium you created and it dilates, sometimes called systolic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy, or your, your, you know, your chamber is pretty, pretty fixed here. If you grow inward, remember you're, we're doing concentric hypertrophy, you may get the inability to relax because there's so much muscle in there. This is restrictive cardiomyopathy. So, and a lot of times in real life, you get combined type cardiomyopathy from heart failure. So this whole thing, the cycle of hypertension, remodeling, hypertension, remodeling, eventually becomes deleterious and your heart fails. Camden, what are some signs or symptoms that we might start getting into heart failure? Well, there's plenty that we can start to think about. Um, I'm going to also, well, before I answer, I want to open it up to the audience. Let's see. Yeah. What do you think about guys and uh, gals out there? You know, you have a person, you're on fire. Exactly. You have a person coming in. Well, let's describe the patient. So, you know, we're usually a little bit more advanced in our years at this point. Let's say a 70 year old coming in, uh, if, you know, progressive dyspnea. That's getting worse um, uh, over the past, you know, several months. Uh, you know, they have a history of a whole list of cardiac uh, problems uh, that will be listed on your U World or Step One question. Mm -hmm. They'll they'll make sure you know that this patient has a cardiac history, and they also come in with you know edema and other signs of heart failure, one of which I'm not going to say because it's going to give away an answer to our later question. Um, but they're going to come in with all these things that point us to the clues of the heart is not A, pumping enough, B, there are fluid imbalances, um, you know, that, uh, you know, we could be having backup that leading to our edema. And then C, uh, we're going to start to have these very tangible side effects like dyspnea, which are due to some really interesting underlying pathophysiology that all gets back to this fact that our heart is unable to push out blood against the afterload that exists on the system at that time. Beautiful. So before we go, uh, before we go forward, I wanted to ask again, does anyone need anything reviewed? Is anything confusing? because we're trying to build from the basics um, through a little bit of fizz, pathophys, and now soon we're gonna talk about pharmacology. So does anyone need to go over anything? Does everyone understand preload, afterload, uh, contractility, hypertension, and this cycle of cardiac remodeling and um, you know, repeated injury? All right. In that case, we'll move on to this next slide. Before we leave here, natriuretic peptides. These are very, very important these days. Atrial and brain natriuretic peptide. Turns out it's not in the brain, it's in the ventricle. Uh, <laughs> but natriuretic peptides, um, their job is to, is to do the opposite of the RAS system. If the RAS system says there's not enough perfusion, we need to save because there's hunting or there's something, you know, there's predators out there, the natriuretic peptides are the exact opposite. They notice atrial or ventricular stretch and tell the kidney, we're good. Get rid of some of this. They respond to increased preload in this case. So what happens in heart failure as we go through these systems is as you have an inappropriately large amount of RAS and an inappropriately small amount of natriuretic peptides so that this seesaw tilts leftward and we get this positive feedback loop. And if you don't, I can't tell you how many times in the ER I've diagnosed heart failure from somebody in their 60s who uh, just had some leg swelling or just had some dyspnea and they're, you know, they've been sleeping in the past couple of years on a recliner. Um, 
and all stuff like that, and all these these little subtle symptoms, um, because their their blood pressure has been 160 for the past 30 years. Uh, it takes a long time to become symptomatic. Now, this is a beautiful picture right here. This is an amazing picture. This is one of my favorites because there's so much going on here, but it tells you what's happening here. And it also tells you the meds that you need to know. In particular, you need to know, there's, there's, there's an old saying for step one. If there's a mortality benefit, there's a question. Anything that has a mortality benefit is automatically high yield by definition. Everything here has a mortality benefit in red. Does anyone notice, and there's, this is unfortunately a read my mind sort of question, what is missing from this particular slide that we give everyone with heart failure? So, I don't know. I, I give this medication all the time. It's Lasix or furosemide. So fun fact, Lasix is actually a portmanteau that means last six hours. So that's why they named it, because that's how long Lasix lasts. Uh, but Lasix does not have a mortality benefit. It's an odd and, you know, it's an odd omission here. The whole point is that the medications that you treat heart failure with that have a mortality benefit change this slide we just talked about. Mm -hmm. This, they downregulate your RAS system as in your ACE inhibitors, your mineralic corticoid antagonists like spironolactone, your beta blockers like metoprolol, carvedilol, bisoprolol. Those three have mortality benefit. Why the others? Because no one studied them. That's the, that's the answer for that one. Um, your Valsartan, this one right here, Secubitril. When I was a second year in med student, this was the biggest thing in the world. This was going to change the world of heart failure. And then it just hit the market like when I was in clinical rotations. It was so good. They had to stop the study early because it was no longer ethical to give people usual care anymore. Incredible, incredible advances. Because for years, we had been treating the RAS part of it. But we neglected the ARNI part of it, the natriuretic peptides. And so the whole point of it is you know, that when, if we want to treat heart failure, we not only need to lower the blood pressure, which takes away the primary factor of this, we also need to return the seesaw of natriuresis and the renin angiotensin system. So, and we do all that with, with beta blockers, with mineralocorticoid, with ACE inhibitors, with neprilysin inhibitors, and that helps us come back. So before we, what's it called? We slide forward and do a couple questions and talk through this. I say, let's summarize. Yeah. So, and let's go through each one of these slides again, just for a moment, just to, yep. just to rebuild our, our castle that we've made here. So starting at the beginning, your heart has a stroke volume and a heart rate, and together they tell you how much cardiac output is there. So the heart rate goes up and down based off of fight or flight or whatever it may be. Your stroke volume depends on your preload, which is the amount of fluid, your afterload, the amount of back pressure that the vasculature is giving you, and the contractility, which is just the intrinsic ability of the heart. Now, applying our new knowledge to this, in what is our problem here? So preload, afterload, or contractility. If hypertension is our problem, which one is, is the problem? Is it preload, afterload, or contractility? And for bonus points, how are we trying to fix it physiologically? I don't know. Little, little spicy for the evening. So it is an increase in afterload that is causing it. And we try to compensate for an increase in contractility and an increase in preload. The contractility is the cardiac remodeling we just talked about. Mm -hmm. The increase in preload is the retention of fluid that often leads 
to the dyspnea and the leg swelling itself. So we had this great picture here uh, with the lub and the dub. And again, the Camden, remind them again, what is the beauty of this Frank Starling curve? The beauty How of does it apply here? Exactly. The beauty of this Frank Starling curve is as we increase that preload, we're increasing that ventricular and diastolic volume. We increase it in a healthy, normal person. We're going to have this increase in the, you know, our stroke volume. We're going to have this increase in our contractility that's going to allow us to get all of that blood that we've now kind of loaded up in the heart out. But at a certain point, when we have more and more remodeling, we've had that long-term afterload that's causing us to stretch and kind of get this left ventricular dysfunction, this extra stretching, this pathophysiologic stretching, this curve goes down. Now we're going to fill up the heart really, really big with a lot of fluid, and we're not going to be able to get it all out. And that is one of the contributing factors of the backup that you start to see in these heart failure patients. And you can start to see too how dilated and restrictive cardiomyopathy may actually happen at the micro level. Mm -hmm. when, you're, when you have failure to perfuse all this heart tissue you have been making, then you start to get dilated cardiomyopathy. You start to get inappropriately elongated uh, sarcomeres. And by the way, the answer is 2.2 millimeters on step one. I don't know why that's it. <laughs> yeah, they do like to include that in there. And for I don't anyone, know why. You know, that's just while we're- optimal sarcomere length. Why so. we are, are here, I just, I do want to give, because this is, you know, I know we're doing a quick review here, but I did want to say for anyone who's having a hard time thinking about sarcomeres, because this not only applies to cardio, it applies to all, you know, a lot of other systems like musculoskeletal, is just think of them almost, you know, I want you to picture these, 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 um, uh, this image in your head as you go through it and think about your actin, your myosin as these kind of sticky fingers that are trying to work with each other and they need a certain amount of overlap in overlap in order for them to get that optimal stretch. That's what you're seeing here. But then at a certain point, you can only do so much when only the tips of your sticky fingers are kind of yeah, touching together. And then, oh, you know, they're not gonna be able to fully contract anymore. So that's just kind of another mental image to use when you start thinking about this contractility. You can stretch and stretch, but too much stretching is not a good thing. Beautiful. And then we, we've talked about our curves mm -hmm. and how they step loves, loves, loves. Mm -hmm. So Camden did a great job going through each one of these. These are the, some of the most common ones that you will see on step one. Is they're going to give you either a clinical scenario and ask you to predict what this curve looks like, mm -hmm. or they're gonna give you the curve with the dotted line. And they're gonna ask you what clinical scenario happens. And it's an archetypal step one skill, going from picture or chart to words and back and forth. If you can do nothing else, go back and forth from words to pictures and you will go very far because that's how they test if you actually understand the physiology. Mm -hmm. They give you a picture, they change it, they make you correlate. And so we've talked almost ad nauseum about this cycle now. And again, it's this imbalance between the renin angiotensin system and the natriuretic peptides that causes this problem. But, and it becomes cycling, cycling, and just so problematic. And hypertension is a big problem too, because it doesn't just cause heart failure. It can precipitate strokes, for which if you're taking step two, it's the, it's the biggest risk factor for stroke. It's not actually tobacco, which it is for most things. It's actually hypertension. So as well as it can um, cause loss of limbs, it can mm -hmm. cause peripheral vascular disease. Mm -hmm. It's a very nasty disease. So, and if you're taking step two or the medicine shelf soon, make sure you know your JNC9 guidelines. There's not a 10 out yet, right? No, I don't think so yet. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> uh, <laughs> In the ER, we have a joke and it says, does the blood pressure start with a one? All right, I'm happy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we don't manage them quite the same way that family medicine and internal medicine does. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, and then coming back again to your, to your pharmacology, 
why we spent so much time talking about the pathophysiology is because the pharmacology comes right from it. Things that have mortality benefit, which is going to be on your exam, comes from this and it explains exactly why it happens. So if you want to reverse this, then you've got to block RAS and you've got to promote the natural resources to prevent the remodeling. And at the same time, you've got to take care of the initial insult, which is the hypertension itself. So um, any questions uh, before we go do some practice questions? So I'll give everyone uh, you know, 10 or 15 seconds and then to sort of digest this and we'll jump right in. And while, the, while we're uh, you know, waiting on any questions, if there's one thing that I want you to take away from this lecture that's not academic is that Take care of your heart and go get some exercise and eat right. <laughs> so, Hypertension oh, is no joke. <laughs> it's the, the things you see. I'm actually on a pediatric anesthesia rotation right now. Ooh, and it's just basically intubating you know, kids. And we have a whole day full of, uh, of teeth repairs. <laughs> and it reminded me to floss more. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'd gotten away from it recently, and I was like, oh boy, this, this poor kid's having 14 teeth removed. I'm going to floss. Oh, yeah, yeah, it'd be good to floss. Oh, so, but yeah, take care of your heart. Go running. I can't run, so I walk, but uh, go lift things. I can do that. All right, Camden, time for me to be quiet. Oh, bless your soul. The, the eye in the sky runs marathons. I can't do it. But, <laughs> Well, uh, let's take it away with the question. And again, yeah, everyone out there who's out there in the audience, uh, definitely feel free to um, you know chime in. But we're gonna take this question just like Lily would a step one question. So, first, you know, practice some good technique. One of the very first things I do, which is gonna be read the question, not the vignette, the question. Which of the following tests should be performed regularly to monitor her current treatment regimen? Okay, and then we've got a bunch of cardio tests. So they're gonna be asking us something about where they're gonna give us a picture of a patient who we probably did something. And now we need to make sure that whatever we did to her is, or him is, uh, you know, not causing damage or is not going to be contraindicated by monitoring them. Okay. So a 54 year old woman. Okay. So we're not elderly. We're not young. Is diagnosed with locally advanced invasive ductal adenocarcinoma of the breast. She undergoes surgical resection, radiation therapy, and is now being started on adjunctive chemotherapy with cyclophosphamide. Uh, and doxyrubicin. Okay, because we read that question stem first, we know that this, you know, is kind of hitting our radar for something we want to highlight. The patient is scheduled for follow-up by a primary care provider. Which of the following tests should be performed regularly to monitor her current treatment regimen? Said differently, which of these drugs is going to do something that we want to monitor to make sure that we don't accidentally cause harm to our patient and we might need to change things? Okay, first of all, let's answer which, I, I, I don't disagree necessarily with the answer we're seeing, but I wanna answer first, which of the drugs piques your interest when we start to think yeah. about cardio effects? Cyclophosphamide or doxyrubicin? Doxyrubicin, I'm gonna quote David on this, uh, but uh, the red death as it's so often called, um, doxyrubicin is a, uh, effective, but at times brutal drug. And uh, it comes with it a host of cardiac effects, particularly uh, um, kind of dilation and heart failure like we were talking about. So a pharmacological induced um, uh, uh, problem with our cardiac system. And how do we want to monitor that? I mean, I guess let's think a little bit more generally. Um, uh, do we think we should monitor it or do we not? And I think the answer I've already led us to is we're probably not going to say that we need no regular monitor. Yeah. So now let's start to think, what are the effects we're thinking about here? This is a heart failure discussion. So one of the best ways to monitor that is going to be with an echo. That's a really good way to monitor the amount of fluid that's in the heart, the mm -hmm. amount of fluid that's stuck in the heart. You know, after our end systolic volume, our end diastolic volume, valvular pathologies, all of those things can be really nicely tested with an echocardiogram. And so the high yield association here is doxybrubicin is cardiotoxic. Um, and so we need to make sure to monitor uh, 
um, particularly for heart failure and dilation of the ventricle, left ventricle, through echocardiograph. The nice thing about this is it's going to find a problem before she becomes clinically symptomatic. And so it allows us to say a little bit ahead of the curve um, versus just waiting for her to develop the symptoms that we talked about. David, yeah. anything to add on that? I love it. Doxorubicin, the red death, dilated cardiomyopathy. I had to do cardiac ICU last year and all they wanted to order was the echo. I think that's a Glaucon Flecken joke if any of you watch the Glaucon Flecken videos. So what does the echo say? Is the, uh, all right, number two of three. Yes, so. this is a great question, getting right back to why it's important to know your basic physiology. This is gonna answer that question here. Okay, so which of the following findings is more likely to be seen in left-sided heart failure and less likely to be seen in right-sided heart failure. Okay, so we know this is going to be a question about heart failure. We're going to have to figure out why left, why right. Okay, a 64-year-old man uh, with a history of coronary artery disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, type 2 diabetes. This is what I was mentioning earlier when I said they're going to give you a cardiac history, pretty obvious. Uh, presents to his uh, PCP with increasing shortness of breath. That's a sign of heart failure and ankle swelling over the past month. Which are the following findings? So we're trying to figure out, does this patient have left or right side of heart failure? And let's think about, well, actually, let's just go through each of these answers. So lower, I'll, I'll start with this one, uh, lower extremity edema. So what's causing our lower extremity edema? Very generally. What do you think? I'll, I'll give a few seconds for anyone to respond. When I think of the lower extremity edema and heart failure, it kind of gets back to what we talked about earlier, which is which is backup. You know, we're, 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 the heart in general is not kicking out as much blood as we want it to relative to the system at hand. And so we're going to have backup. Where is that backup blood? Can that pool? Our lower extremities. And so that's going to happen no matter if it's right-sided or left-sided. Because remember, our blood's coming back to our heart through the left, sorry, the right atrium and the vena cava. So that one's out. Um, Apatojugular reflex, for a lot of the same reasons. Um, again, we're on the right side here. This is a right-sided problem. So it could be right-sided heart failure or it could be left. Both of them are gonna affect that right side. Abdominal fullness, again, all that goes hand in hand with that. Uh, again, uh, backup, increased ejection fraction. Again, are we expected to see that in our heart failure? No, we're not expected to see that at all. So that's not going to be uh, kind of, that's not a good answer for that. But two, basal or crackles on pulmonary auscultation. Mm -hmm. And why? This gets back to our anatomy. Remember, when we enter the heart, we come in, vena cava, right atrium, we go down through the tricuspid to the right ventricle. Then we go through the pulmonary circulation. We come back to the left atrium, work through our mitral valve to our left ventricle and out through the aorta. If we have right-sided heart failure, we never get to the pulmonary circulation. Our blockage is before that. You know, the roadblock in the road is before we get to the, um, the lungs. And so we're not going to have any fluid, any backup in the lungs. Instead, if we're over and we have uh, left-sided heart failure, we're going to get back up there. And the very first place that it backs up to is in the lungs. And that's one of the reasons you get this dyspnea. This is one of the reasons you get, you know, basal or crackles. And in particular, the crackles mean there's fluid. Fluid means left-sided heart failure. Beautiful. And I love the addition of the, the, the hearts. That's a, a, fitting, a fitting emoji. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well reason, a good way to walk through it too. So, and the last one, 36-year-old man with a history of a stab wound. This one's a little bit harder to the right upper thigh three months ago, presents to the ED with complaints of difficulty breathing while lying flat, has an S3 gallop, warm skin, a continuous brewy, hint, hint, over the right thigh. What is this and what is the cause of it? This is this particular type of heart failure. Now, we didn't touch on it a lot, but it makes a great test question because of how unique it is. Uh, can you, anyone have any idea, A, what this is, or B, why it happens? 
the brewery in particular uh, points in one direction. So this is what's called a high output heart failure. And in contrast, again, we talked about the most common causes of heart failure, hypertension, which is increased afterload, or loss of contractility, which is a heart attack usually. You can also have increased venous return uh, cause heart failure. And that's what this is in this case. This is a high output heart failure from an AV fistula that basically is pushing a bunch of high pressure blood into the venous system, causing way too much blood in the heart than the heart could pump forward. So you get that similar sort of backup and you get the same sort of clinical condition but instead of there being low cardiac output, as the name suggests, there's high cardiac output. Our normal cardiac output is about five-ish liters per minute. And during heart failure, usually down to two or one, a high output cardiac, high output cardiac output. Oof. Uh, I have a high output heart failure. There it is. Um, <laughs> usually has cardiac outputs of seven, eight, nine, ten. The pull point is that there's too much fluid for the heart to be able to move forward. So there's backup as opposed. So again, back to your physiology, always. If it's hypertension, it's increased afterload. If it's a heart attack, it's sudden loss of contractility. And if it's high output heart failure, usually from Paget's disease or from AV fistula, fistula is the one I see most common, um, then you're expected to see uh, increased preload. All right, we're about to do our question and answer. So I hope everyone enjoyed this tonight. A little bit about us and what we do, as you said in the beginning, um, from the nose to the toes of medical education, from the pre-med through the residency, all the way through if it exists in education or advising or test taking or anything, we probably do it. So if there's anything we can do, uh, anything you need, uh, do let us know. Um, you can get a chance to work. Camden and I, again, are active tutors with med school tutors with Blueprint. Love what we do. Um, love working with students because we were just in the same seats as you guys. Same place. Uh, took the same tests and hated it and for the same reasons a lot of times. So, but we like teaching it. Yes, and exactly. We like that process. We enjoy here to being help. on the other side and shepherding everyone um, to, to join us. Um, quick one uh, for FICA. Uh, the answer is three here increased venous return. That is correct. Um, so, does anyone have any questions? And if no questions, did, uh, did you guys and gals, did you enjoy this? Uh, did you find this helpful? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, this is obviously a very difficult topic um, to try and talk out loud with, and we hope we did it some justice. You know, we tried to approach it methodically, going through the basics, and then going through and trying to add a foundation so that when you when you guys see your questions, you know you can pull back on this and you know approach it in a linear way. Why is this happening? And which one of these could it be? Because heart failure questions are tough. Mm -hmm. They're very tough. So we'll give everyone about 60 seconds. Um, and in the meantime, um, uh, Camden, do you have any uh, parting thoughts for this one? Well, um, I have some parting thoughts, but also if there's other topics that people are interested in, yeah. post them in the chat. We're always, you know, we're here to, someone asked earlier, you know, how often uh, we do webinars in general. Uh, there, you know, Blueprint and MST does some sort of webinar once or twice, most weeks. Um, and there's always more material to talk about. And so we'd love to hear from you, you know, what you might want to hear uh, from us on some later webinars. But parting words, uh, I think the most important thing that a lot of students I work with struggle with is that they avoid the basic path, sorry, the basic physiology of the heart. Really the only way to get these cardio questions right, the only way to understand heart failure, and one of the reasons we put so much time into it today, 
is you have to understand the basic physiology. You have to be able to read the charts. You have to know where you're at within the cardiac cycle. You have to know your terms, end systolic, diast and, uh, end diastolic volume, preload, afterload, contractility, all of those terms and be comfortable with them. And then the path of phys actually comes along. It comes along pretty easily once you get that, that basis. And so if you're just starting your studies or you're thinking about starting your studies, that is where I would start um, uh, and really get into the basics. After that, then it's about building off those basics and kind of matching, thinking about, ah, what happens when my homeostatic mechanisms go awry or they work too well, like we were talking about with uh, um, uh, remodeling. And that is uh, how you kind of build on top of it there. So. I think, I think uh, all of you out there will be able to do just fine, though, if you're deliberate in your approach. I love it. So I hope this was helpful. I drew mm -hmm. a little heart of hearts on the top corner <laughs> because we love you guys. Very and um, what's it called? Uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. If there's anything you guys need, feel mm -hmm. free to reach out to us. Yep. Um, and you can you know, ask for us or ask a question directly to us if you just mention it in the email. Um, otherwise, enjoy the rest of your evening. So, yep. and remember the floss <laughs> and the run. <laughs> yeah, and the run, floss and run. Have, Have a, a great one, everyone.